Everywhere I go on this road, high and low, where I go, I go with you. I won't be afraid, this my hope, come what may, where I go, I go with you. There's a city that calls me by name. There's a city that calls me by name. Yes, as I run this race, I am cheered by the saints. There's a city that calls me by name. Everywhere I go on this road, high and low, where I go, I go with you. I won't be afraid, this my hope, come on me, where I go, I go with you. Where I go, I go with you. There's a future that runs through my veins. There's a future that runs through my veins. And there's nothing on earth that can stand in the way. There's a future that runs through my veins. Everywhere I go on this road, I am low. Where I go, I go with you. I'll hold me. It's my home, come on me, where I go, I go with you, where I go, I go with you. There's a spirit I cannot contain, there's a spirit I cannot contain. The same thing where they raised Jesus up from the grave. The same spirit I cannot contain. Everywhere I go on this road, I am low. Where I go, I go with you. I won't be afraid, this my home, come what me. Where I go, I go Where I go, I go with you. Your breath upon these bones, your fire in my soul, your kingdom is my home, and I don't walk alone. Your breath upon My soul, your kingdom is my home, and I don't walk alone. Everywhere I go on this road, high and low, where I go, I go with you. I won't be afraid, this my home, come on me. You guys can have a seat. And I want to direct your attention up here because we've got another baptism this morning. Amen. Welcome, Leoma Baptist Church. How are you this morning? Let me ask that again, see if you guys are still awake. How, how are you guys this morning? Oh, that's better. That's better. 
I want to introduce to you William Frazier. William's been coming to our church now for several months, and I got to talk to him uh, just last week, a couple weeks ago over at Preston's and had lunch together, and he's been saved. He's even been baptized years ago, but as he's been coming here, he wanted to rededicate his life to Jesus Christ, and he really wanted to follow the Lord in baptism, and he just wants to make sure that he's got his life right with the Lord, and I think that's incredible. And so, let's, yeah, let's give William a round of applause. Um, William is deaf, and so he's reading my lips right now, and he's got some implants that he's not wearing, obviously, now because we're getting ready to get them wet. Um, but he reads my lips, and, and he just loves our church and loves you guys. And uh, I want to say, Lord, that I'll do. <laughs> the Lord loves him, right? Amen. Amen. And so, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, William, I'm going to ask you one question. You know for certain you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Well, by your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Jesus in baptism, risen to walk in the newness of life. Amen. Amen. Love you, buddy. <laughs> Woo. Praise the Lord. I'm going to have Anthony come. Lead us in a word of prayer, and I just want to encourage you, if you're here today, and maybe you need to make, make that next step of following the Lord and believers' baptism, we'd love to talk with you. God bless. Anthony? Good morning, church. Good morning. How awesome is it that we just kind of start services here a lot with baptism? Isn't that great? That's what it's all about. Amen. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, you can take a bulletin and fill out the information there and tear that off and take it to our welcome center. We'd love to have a record of you being here. Uh, church family. You know we love you. We know you know you know we love our visitors, and that's why we want to make sure uh, we got a record of them being here, so we can reach out to them and check on them and love on them and pray with them and see what their next steps may be. May just be that this is the church for them. Amen. That's kind of happening here uh, here lately. People's kind of seeing that Leoma Baptist Church is the church for them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we love you with all of our hearts. I love that I can call you my heavenly father. And I love that you're a real God who loves us and loves us so much and loves us so much that even while we were yet sinners, you sent your son Jesus to die for us. And that truth today, Father, is still a mystery and a miracle all wrapped in one that I love more than anything. That you could love a sinner like me and like us. So much that you would send your only son Jesus to lay down his life and shed his lifeblood and take our place. Where the chief of all sinners should have been. Yet he took that place with all of our sin on his shoulders and on him. And so much, Father, you couldn't even look on him. Thank you, Jesus, for laying down your life. Thank you for shedding your blood. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins, those who have come to faith in you. Thank you for saving Bill. Lord, I've got to know him over couple of months and he's just a, 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 a dear, dear, dear man of God and just firmed that up this, this past couple of weeks and, and I'm, we're so thankful for that. Lord, today I pray that you would speak through our pastor from the word of God. There's a lot of word that's going to come forth today. There's a lot of conviction that's going to come forth from the word of God. It's going to prick our hearts today, Father, and we're asking that it would. I'm asking that there would be life change in this house today, in the house of God. I pray the lost would be saved. I pray the saved would be encouraged and challenged and convicted to live a life that's pleasing and honorable to you. You are a holy God in heaven. And you tell us to be holy and live holy as you are holy. And I love that in Christ Jesus we can do that. Have your own way in this place, Lord. Have your own way. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Before we sing this next song, uh, I want to have some scriptures on the screen. And we're just going to read through these. And I want you to hear the common theme in these scriptures is that God is holy and he has called us, his people, to be holy. And we're going to be singing about that soon. And really, we're going to be joining the angels as they are singing that same song, holy, 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 around the throne of God. Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus 19.2 And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
Isaiah 6, 3. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. Psalm 29, 2. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter 1, 16. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. 1 Peter 1, 15. But the Lord of hosts will be exalted in judgment, and the holy God will show himself holy in righteousness. Isaiah 5, 16. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill. For holy is the Lord our God. Psalm 99, 9. For I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy. For I am holy, Leviticus 11.45. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. 1 Chronicles 16.10. Thus you are to be holy to me. For I, the Lord, am holy. And I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine. Leviticus 20.26. Yet... You are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Psalm 22, 3. I invite you to stand with me as we just sing about that holy God that we just read about in his word. Scribe of perfect skill with flawless words could capture all you are. No lofty thought, no scholar of this world could grasp an inch of such infinity. Though we can.
Bless your name. How great Thou art, how 
Son, not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in. But on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take. sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul Lord Jesus, you are great and you are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our worship, Lord. And you are holy. You are the one who is enthroned upon the praises of your people. You are the one who sits on the throne while the angels are flying around you, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. God, we praise you this morning because of who you are, and God, we thank you and we worship you because of what you've done for us and for the way that you've made accessible through Jesus Christ back to you. You have reconciled God and man. We praise you for that and we worship you. We pray these things in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. good to see our folks all the way from Shanghai, China with us today. I know, oh, there, there you are, uh, the Prince family are here visiting with us, so glad to see you guys. Good to have you all. We've missed you guys, and 
love following you guys on social media and see what's happening with your families. The boys had another birthday, didn't they? Yeah, unbelievable. Good to have you guys here. If you have your Bibles, turn over to 2 Peter chapter 1. Um, we have been in this series called Mindset. We've talked about what it means to have a Christian mindset. What does it look like in our, in our lives? And uh, today I wanted to read from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. I want to start the message off with this passage of Scripture. Let this be the foundation of what we're going to talk about today because we're going to keep it real simple today. It says this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. It says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many in the room would just really prefer to be ineffective and unproductive? Anybody? I hope not. Um, We like to be effective people, right? We like to be productive people. And this scripture is really clear. It says no one wants to do that. If, if, If we need to be productive, if we want to be effective... We've got to make, listen, we've got to make every effort, not just a little effort, not just some effort. We've got to make every single effort at possible, anything that's possible, every effort to do all the things that are mentioned in this passage of Scripture. It says that we've got to make every effort to be faithful, to be good, to be knowledgeable, to be self-controlled, to persevere, to be godly, to be kind, to be loving, if we do these things, we will not be ineffective. We will not be unproductive. It's, folks, it's a mindset. It's a mindset of how you go about your everyday Christian life. And so the last three weeks, we've been talking about this mindset. We've used Colossians 3.2 as kind of our focal verse. We've said, set your mind on things above. We've talked about looking at things the way God looks at them, not just keeping your eyes here on the here and now, on the earthly things. The scripture clearly says we need to keep our minds on things above, not on things of the earth. And so the last three weeks we've been talking about this. And if you've been attuned to what's going on in our world, you're probably aware that something is happening that we as Christians don't like. What we're seeing is that as there's not much difference between Christians and the rest of the world. God forbid that should be so. We should be different. There should be a difference in us. And so what we're doing here, the Bible says, the Bible exhorts us to come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. That's what the Bible says. So we need to be different. We need to be separate from the world. We need to be different. And I'm fully convinced that there's a lot of so-called Christians, listen, I'm doing this out of love, there's, I think there's a lot of so-called Christians who have not completely bought into this mindset yet. They're just kind of Christian by a check in the box. Yeah, I go to church, and yeah, I want to have eternal life with Jesus, and that's, that's about it. But folks, listen, to be, to be Christ-like is important. So this series, we've kind of looked at things of how, how do we look at things above? How do we not look at things on the earth? We've discussed a mindset for the family. We've talked about the roles of husbands and wives and kids. We've talked about last week a mindset about life in general. It was Sanctity of Human Life Day last Sunday. And today, I'm just going to keep it really, really Really simple and basic, right? I am not going to probably say anything that you have not known or heard before. This is really basic. We want to talk about what it looks like to have a Christian mindset in our everyday life. What does it look like? We're going to keep it really basic. In fact, if you've ever been to church, if you've ever read the Bible, I'm going to probably be saying things that you have heard before. But folks, that's the very reason I want to repeat it today is because I think what's happening is that as Christians, we're often overlooking and ignoring the very simple foundations of our faith. And folks, we can't do that. And so many times what we want to do as Christians is we want to just plunge right into the depths of, of God's Word. And we kind of forget of what it means, the foundations of what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be Christ-like. How does that play out in our everyday lives? When you go to work tomorrow, how does this play out? Students, when you go to school tomorrow, how does this play out? 
How, how do we kind of let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works? How does that happen? How does that work? So I'm not going to really assume a whole lot, but I'm going to assume this. I'm going to assume that we understand what being a Christian is. Being a Christian is not just being a good person. Amen? Yes. Right? I mean, it's not. All good people do not go to heaven. Right? I want you to understand that. A, a, a Christian is somebody who has been transformed by the grace of God and has the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. That's a Christian. Okay, and when you are a Christian and you come to God in humility, not, not listen, you don't come to God on your own terms, but you come to God in humility, not on your own terms, and you ask Him for the forgiveness of sins and you want God to take control of your life, that means you're a Christian. And there's a crisis that happens there because what happens is in this crisis experience, it brings you to be a Christian. And then my question is, what does that look like? What should that look like? What should it look like in our everyday life? And that's going to be real simple today. So we're just going to, I mean, if you've looked at the, the notes on your bulletin, it's really three blanks. It's real simple. We're going to keep it really, really simple today. We're going to go a lot of scripture. I've listed some scripture on your notes so you can hang on with those and kind of study those when you get home. But I want us to look at three attitudes Three demeanors that we should have to be pleasing and holy and honoring to Christ Jesus. Three attitudes that present a mindset of Jesus Christ to others. Here's the first one. You ready? Be nice. Just be nice, right? How many of you parents have said to your kids, be nice, right? Have you ever said that? You know, I mean, listen, it's important for us to understand that we should be nice. Now, this probably should go without saying, but I need to repeat it today because what happens in the Christian community is that some people walk around as Christians with a scowl on their face and they're just kind of have an unpleasant demeanor and they just look like they want to bite your head off. That's not very Christ-like. Sometimes people, listen, sometimes I've heard people say Christians are just downright mean. I just shouldn't be so. Right? I mean, I, this is what happens. Is, is if you have a sour look on your face, if you have a, an unpleasant disposition about you, uh, what happens when, when Christians aren't nice, what they do is they always see the problem. They always see the negative. They're very, very good at pointing out what's wrong, what's negative, what's bad, this is wrong. They're, they're, they come across as insulting. They come across as judgmental and critical. And folks, I'm talking about Christians. It's even worse in the secular world. I mean, in the secular world, we, we, a lot of social scientists now are talking about, you know, and commenting on how there's this coarsening of our culture. There's, there's just, I mean, people are just mean. They're just, just rude. And, and good manners and courtesy are just out the door. That typical kindness and social graces are not being used anymore. When was the last time you heard somebody say to you, no, sir, yes, sir, no, ma'am, yes, ma'am. I mean, those, those things aren't being said anymore. People are, are, are rude. They're, they're pushy. I was in Walmart Friday morning at 7.30 in the morning thinking, I've got it made. There's going to be nobody in here. And there were like two lines open, and I had a cart of about six things. It was six things, six. And I was just kind of, <laughs> and this 72-year-old lady nearly knocked me over to get in front of me in line. And I was just going, go ahead with your bad self, girl. I mean, go ahead. You know, I don't let you in anyway, but, man, you don't have to be pushy and rude about it. But this is the life. We see this. Y'all are laughing because you see it. Some of you are laughing because that's you. I mean, get out on the roadways and see how rude and pushy and full of rage people are, right? I mean, our speech has become vulgar. They're cussing now on Burger King commercials. And that, it's, just, it's just accepted, and that's just the way it is. And so, so, I mean, we come across kind of as crude. And, folks, I just, I'm just saying out loud as your pastor, as a man who wants to preach from God's Word, we just need to get back to being nice. 
being kind. I, I think what we've done is we've, we've so overreacted to the misconception that a nice person has to be a Christian that we've forgotten that being nice is really a very important part about being a Christian. It's just simply being kind and nice to others. What does that mean to be nice? What does that look like, Pastor? Well, let me kind of tell you. It means to be a genuinely good person. To just be a good person. To treat people, listen, to treat people with patience. To treat people with kindness and respect. Even when they disagree with you. Even when they're rude to you. We're called as Christians to be self-sacrificing and, and generous. It, it, means, it means to tip your waitress, folks. Especially on Sundays. Well. It means to smile. Listen, it means to smile at the person who's serving you or waiting on you, even when they are rude to you or they're having a bad day. That's what being kind is all about. It means meeting people where they are and loving them and not be too quick to just kind of stereotype people and say, nope, don't like them. I'm not going to talk with them. I'm not dealing with them. We're quick to do that. Oh, don't like you. Don't like how you're dressed. Don't like how you wear. I don't like what you're, what you're saying. I'm not going to, nope, 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 not me. Folks, we've got to stop that. We've got to start being nice. Everybody smile. See, it, I mean, you just look nicer when you smile. It's just pleasant, right? It's just wonderful when you do that. So I, mean, I want you to understand this. this. I like the way the Bible puts this. And I'm, I'm going to give you a couple scriptures here. The Bible tells us what happens, listen, when we genuinely accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It says this in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I think the problem is a lot of Christians still have a heart of stone. And so I've never understood, folks, why the church and church people are so intolerant of some sins and so accepting of others. I don't understand why we are tolerant of people who gossip and spread rumors, but we are intolerant of the struggling parent who has a fussy baby in church. I think what happens is we, we're losing sight of some scripture. You know, Titus 3 verse 10 says, Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful and he is self-condemned. That's pretty powerful words coming from God's word. This is something that obviously God does not tolerate. God wants us to be kind. He wants us to be nice. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 says this. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of, now listen to what he says to get rid of. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind. Be kind, the Bible says. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That's, that's God's word. And if we're not kind, if we're being mean-spirited, we are grieving the heart of God, according to Scripture. So if we're going to please God, we've got to be kind, we've got to be compassionate, we've got to be forgiving. Folks, it's, it's not, listen, it's not just church behavior. It is so easy to be kind and nice here. But I'm talking about everyday behavior. I'm talking about in geometry class, at the plant, at the Walmart at 7.30 on a Friday morning. I, I, I'm talking about when you get your hair done, when, when, when the service guy comes and he didn't do it quite right. I mean, I, I'm talking about every single day life. It's important for us to have this kind of mindset. Folks, listen, what does it say that we as Christians, we'll, we'll get to a restaurant and we will, we will pray the most incredible, godly, biblical prayer. And then we're rude to our waitress. 
What does it say when we pray at our meals out in public and then we don't even, we don't even really tip very well? Or worse than that, we don't tip at all and we give a gospel track. Come on, people. Are you kidding me? Listen, I'm all about giving a gospel tract to somebody, but put about 20% tip on there. They may read it then. Folks, I, I just want you to understand, we are a witness to the world. We are called to be salt and light to the world. The world is already cynical about Christians. Okay? Listen to what it says in James 2, 14 and 19. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. Folks, you can't separate faith and action. Let me say it this way. You can't separate faith and being nice. Right? Everybody smile again. Because y'all, y'all, y'all worry me when they kind of start gra- grinning. You know, go, yeah. smile, okay? Okay, we're just, just being nice, okay? Listen, we got to do this. What, folks, we've, here's what we've seen in this world. Here's what the lost world sees. Listen, listen. This gets real. The lost world sees religious people who are mean-spirited fly planes into buildings and kill thousands. So for a lost world, they need to see some nice Christians, right? And folks, I don't think any of us want to be a part of a terrorist group. We are a part of the kingdom of God. And we need to act as such. So if you, listen, if you don't think, if you're going, oh, pastor, you're just exaggerating that. Listen, you study Christian history. And you see what happened when Christians kind of got off track of God's word. And you see how violent and how terrorizing they were. You look, you look like at history books and find out. It can happen. And folks, it's, it's, we've got to get back to these basic principles of just simply being nice. It's a mindset. It's a mindset. Being nice is, is, is critical to our witness in this world. The Bible says it this way in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, and 12. I love this. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Listen. To mind your own business. That's what it says right there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. To mind your own business and to work with your hands just as we told you so that your daily life, your everyday life, may win the respect of outsiders. That's God's word. It's powerful. So a part of being a Christian means that our, our whole demeanor changes. There's a transformation, and Titus 3, 3 through 5 says, At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice. By the way, malice is just being unkind. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Some little kid just say, he's not supposed to say hate. No, we're not. We shouldn't be known for hating one another. But then he says, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. See, it changed everything. It changed everything. So, folks, here's here's point number one. Ready? Be kind. Everybody smile. Be kind, right? I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, here's number two. Ready? Number two. Be positive. Be positive. Listen, the biblical world word for a positive attitude is the word hope. Have hope. We should be the most positive people on planet Earth. Amen? By the way, just, just newsflash, you are all dead in your sins as Christians. And you have been made alive in Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, that makes me want to do a cartwheel up here. I'm not going to, just for the sake of some of you that might have a heart attack and have to call 911. That wouldn't be good. 1 Peter 1 3 says this Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. I love that. 
We are, we, we're, we are to be of those people who have hope. We are not to be of those people who have no hope. Hope. We're supposed to be positive. We're supposed to have an outlook that's optimistic. We don't have to kind of just wag our heads and walk in and say, oh, look what the world has come to. Oh, I mean, listen. Man, if you watch CNN news all day long, you are going to be in despair. I promise you. You are not going to be a happy person. Stop it. Stop it. Be happy. Be positive. It's, it's easy because I think we as Christians, so what happens is we know what the world should be, and yet we see in reality what it is, and that causes us to be in despair. And so we ended up kind of talking about, oh, what the world has come to, and oh, woe is me, and oh, this is horrible, and oh, I just want Jesus to come. Listen, I want Jesus to come too, but folks, we are people rooted not in this world. We are rooted in eternity. And he's got a purpose for us here and now. We are living, folks, we are living for the next world. And we have everything to be positive about. God has a purpose in our lives right now. It's called a blessed hope. Here's what it says in Titus 2, 11 through 14. This is this positive attitude that we are supposed to express. It says this, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope. While we wait for the blessed hope. And then he has a big dash as if to say, look, let me tell you what that blessed hope is all about. And he says this, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. Listen, a people who are eager to do what is good. Are you eager to do what is good? Are you eager to be kind? Are you eager to be positive? Optimism, folks, listen, I want you to understand. Listen, if you're going to work tomorrow, you need to absolutely be the best upbeat positive worker in your workplace tomorrow. I don't care if the plant is shutting down and everybody's losing all their pensions and all their jobs. You need to go, hey, guys, let's go. I'll take you all to breakfast. We're going to get through this together. You understand that? You need to be positive. Students, listen, I don't, I don't care that there's a surprise pop quiz in math tomorrow. You should say, you know what, guys, we're going to be fine. Let me sharpen your pencils. Here you go. Let's go. We're going to be good. We'll, we'll, we'll share snacks afterward. It's, it's positive. It's being positive, right? Have you all been in those negative situations where somebody kind of lit up the room and was positive and it made your day? That should be you. That should be us as Christians. We ought to just absolutely, in all of our attitudes and all our ethical behaviors, we just need to shine in front of other people. Optimism, folks, is a greatly important part of our faith. The great theologian dr seuss once said this don't cry because it's over smile because it happened what a great outlook right don't cry because it's over smile because it happened folks christians should be positive we should be optimistic because we are living in our father's world he shines through everything. Why don't we stop? Why don't we start looking at the positive things? Hey, there's a new idea. Let's look at things that are positive. Instead of searching on social media and online on all the things that are negative, why don't we search for the things that are positive? Wouldn't that be an incredible change? Amen. Listen, I'm telling you, if all you do is look for the negative, you'll find it every single time. And it will depress you. And it will make you mean-spirited. And it will just make you got to go, ugh. But why, what if all of a sudden we started looking at the good things in the world? What, what if all of a sudden we just kind of started shining? Because uh, I want you to know that God's in charge of all things, by the way. Hey, a newsflash. He's a sovereign, mighty God. He's not surprised by anything that's going on in your life. He's not surprised by the tragedy or the crisis or the, the plant shutting down or the bankruptcy. He's not surprised by the divorce. He's not surprised that you have some kind of kid that's kind of gone crazy and it's not come back home. He's not surprised by any of that. He has not called a meeting in the heavenly realms going, oh my goodness, did you hear what happened in Lawrence County? He's not doing that because he's a sovereign, holy, mighty God who's in charge of all things. And he's called us to be kind and to be 
positive. And when we complain about how terrible things are, we're not explain, expressing that witness that God wants us to. Here's how Paul said it. Here's how he said we ought to be. In Romans 8, 37, he says this. No. No, he says. In all these things. In other words, all these, all these tragedies, all these circumstances, all this bad stuff that we hear. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, he says, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither not height or depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate us. Look, we are loved. We are cared for. What better reason to have than to have a positive mental mindset, outlook, attitude, a hopeful outlook on life. We need to be more positive, church. Amen? Let me give you one more. It's the last one. Be kind. Be, be, you know, be, be kind. Be positive. Sure. Here's the, here's the last one. Be thankful. Be thankful. You are not going to enjoy life if you, if, unless you learn the art of being thankful. It's important. Listen, being negative and being complaining all the time, it will destroy your joy. You will have no, how many of y'all know people like that are just negative all the time? They're not good, they're not fun to be around. They're not people you want to be on your team. They're not people you want to work with. They're not people you want in your class project. They're negative all the time. I don't want to be around them. Because we have so much to be positive about. We're loved, we're cared for, all these great things. And look, uh, listen to what the Bible says. Joy, I mean, listen. Joy will come to you when you kind of look at things through the eyes of gratitude. When we, have, we look at things above and not on things of the earth. Here's what the Bible says in Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything. That, that's the Greek word for anything. It means, it means anything, any crisis, any situation, anything that didn't go quite your way, anything that you may have heard on the news. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Instead of going to social media, we need to go to God. Instead of calling a friend, we need to go to God. Instead of complaining and gossiping and rumoring with it about anybody who wants to listen, we need to go to God. Amen? That, that's how the Bible says for us to deal with that. Y'all know Jimmy Dean? You know, Jimmy Dean, the old country music singer that's kind of, you know, has like a pork sausage kind of millionaire business or something, you know? Sells those little breakfast biscuits. He actually wrote a song. He co-wrote a song that kind of celebrates life's little, small blessings. And the name of the song is Drinking From My Saucer. I'm not going to sing it for you, praise the Lord. But I am going to give you the key verse that I want you to kind of hang on to today. So Lord, help me not to gripe about the tough rows that I've hoed. I'm drinking from my saucer because my cup has overflowed. Oh, church. Maybe we need to look at our overflowing cups a little more. Like I've watched you come in today. Got your, got your wife, got your husband, got your kids. You drove up in a nice car. You're walking. You're, you're healthy. You've got clothes on your back. You've got a full breakfast this morning. You're getting eating lunch somewhere. We've already got plans for lunch somewhere. Our cups are overflowing. We are in this building. We have each other. We've got a great ministry that's doing incredible things. We saw somebody get baptized this morning. Our cups are overflowing, and maybe it's time for us to start drinking out of our saucer. Maybe it's time for us to lighten up and look up and look at things above and not on things of the earth. Maybe it's time for us to stop being so negative and ungrateful and, and, and unkind. Maybe it's time for us to have a new, different mindset. Amen? 
Maybe it's time for us to kind of think of things differently and be actually thankful, to be gracious, to be generous. Maybe it's time for us to be nice, to be positive, to be thankful. Maybe it's essential. Maybe, maybe we need to understand it's essential for us to do those things, to have the mindset of Christ, to be an appropriate witness for his kingdom. So folks, listen. If you want to grow spiritually, if you want our church to grow spiritually, we're going to have to all be kind. We're going to have to all be positive. Smile with me now. Come on. What is it? Okay. Yeah. You're right. We're going to have to be grateful. Those are simple things. Those are so simple. But let me go back to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. I want to read it again. And now that you've got maybe a different mindset, let's read it again. For this very reason. What reason are we talking about? The reason, the fact that you are born on this earth. You're here right now to be a witness. You are called to be salt and light. For this very reason, Peter says, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And to goodness, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. And to self-control, perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure. Did you notice what the Bible says? It's an increasing measure. You never just kind of get there and say, I've got my bucket full, I'm good. No, no, no. You, you, for the rest of your life, you're increasing in your measure of all those things, all the goodness and kindness and perseverance. You're increasing in measure. It says, it says for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, my challenge this morning is for us to get to work as a church. But let's get to work at having a different mindset. Let's get to work and, and, and really kind of focus on being kind and, and positive and, and grateful and generous and loving and considerate and sympathetic. Let's, let's make every effort to be effective and productive in the kingdom of God. We've got lots of work to do here. If all we're doing is complaining about everything that's wrong, we're never going to get it done, ever. Let's be kind. Let's be positive. Let's be grateful. Jesus Christ has saved you. You were dead in your sins, and he saved you. So I, here, here's what I know about an audience this size. There's probably a few of you here that maybe have never made that conscious decision to follow Jesus Christ in a personal, intimate relationship with him. And, and you probably have heard this message, and it's just kind of gone over your head because you don't get the whole being kind and positive and thankful and gracious and giving because you don't have Jesus in you. The Holy Spirit is not indwelling inside of you. Let me just say, first of all, I'm so glad that you're here today, that that's you. And I encourage you during the invitation, we'll have a couple of pastors up here, Brother Anthony will be up, up, up here, I'll be up here. I would love for us to just chat with you. All you need to do is come up and say, you know what, I, I, I probably need to be saved. And we'll take as much time as possible to walk you through. We'll encourage you. We'll meet with you. You can meet with us. We'll have lunch together. We'll, we'll, do, we'll, we'll bend over backwards to kind of help you understand what it means to become a Christian. We're not going to ask anything of you because Jesus has already done it all. You don't have to do anything. You just have to receive it. Right? If that's you today, you need to get that right. But I really believe for the rest of us here that are Christians, for the rest of us who have already made that decision to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior, and I'm talking to every single person in this room, including me. We need to be more kind. We need to be more positive. We need to be more thankful and grateful. We need to kind of work on that mindset in this church and in our lives and in our families and in our workplaces and in our schools. And I dare say that all of us, including me, are struggling in some of those areas right now. Some of us are spending too much time on the negative. We need to spend more time on the positive. Some of us are just kind of ungrateful for what's going on in our lives. And we're just kind of drowning in a pity of woe and woo. 
We need to be more positive. Some of us just, some of us are just downright mean. And we need to change. Remember, remember the story of Scrooge? He was a mean old guy, wasn't he? But something changed in him, right? And he was changed for the rest of his life, and he was known as a good man. Folks, listen. I don't know what you're known as at work or at school. But let's be nice. Let's be positive. Let's be, let's be grateful. So here's what I would suggest that you do. If you're a Christian here today, and we're going we're gonna to sing the invitation in just a few minutes. We're going to stand up. Listen, there, there's nothing magical about this, this property up here at this altar, but I think there's something positive that goes on inside of you when you get out of your comfort zone where you're sitting. You get out from where you are and you come up and you just kind of say, God, I need, I need to be better at this. God, I need you to help me with being kinder, being more positive, being more grateful. There's something about that that's healthy. At the first service this morning, we had people during the worship songs coming up here praying at the altar. It was a beautiful thing to see. And I encourage you that during this invitation that maybe that's you. And maybe you know exactly the situation I'm talking about. Maybe you know exactly what, you know, that situation at work or at school with your family. That you've just been downright just kind of ornery and mean and negative and ungrateful. It's time for those things to change. It's time for us to be salt and light to this world. The world is watching us. And I hope they see Jesus. I hope they see the kindness and the compassion of Jesus. I hope that we make it our ambition, as Thessalonians says, to mind our own business and to be kind and to be positive and to be thankful. Let's have a different mindset, church. Will you stand and pray with me? God, I know for every person in this room today, this is, and for me, this is a hard message. This is one that's gripped my heart because, God, it's so easy to just get caught up and what the world wants us to do and how the world wants us to react. And it's so easy to just kind of become a complainer and to be negative and to be ungrateful, to be unkind. But God, I know you've called us to be something different. You've called us to be salt. You've called us to be light. You've called us to be a witness into this world. And so God, I just ask that right now that you're convicting the hearts of believers in this room. But God, you, you, are, you know those situations in their life. You know what they're thinking about right now. I just pray, God, that they'll take a step and they'll make that change today. That they'll make it their effort. They'll, they'll make every effort to be good, to be kind, to be persevering, to be loving, to be grateful, to be long-suffering. God, I pray that if there's someone lost here today that they need to know that God, you loved them so much that you sent Jesus to die for their sins. Even while they were still sinners, Jesus died on the cross and took all their punishment and all their sin and shame away. God, I pray that they will make that commitment. They will surrender their lives to you in an awe-inspiring way. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will convict lives today. So God, we know this altar is open. God, we know... Your Holy Spirit is convicting lives. And I just pray as we sing today, God, that you will move in the hearts and minds of people today. That, God, you'll put a smile on our face. You'll put a kick in our step. You'll put a joy in our heart that comes from you. And, God, we'll take it with us to work. We'll take it with us to school. We'll take it with us for the rest of our lives. And we'll be the most positive, upbeat people on the face of this earth because we have the joy, 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 joy down in our hearts down in our hearts today. Come, as we sing, come. Step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see the beauty that made this heart adore you. Bye.